Good afternoon, everyone in Photo Lover Land. You are watching a Thursday edition of I Love Photography Live. I'm Alan Murabayashi, broadcasting to you from New York, the world headquarters of Photo Shelter. I'm joined, as always, by my super co-host, Sarah Jacobs. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm good. We're trying to move this to Thursday. Yes, we are. Today's the first uh, edition of that. Today's the first day, yeah. And we'll see uh, if we get more viewers or, you know, changing things up. It's called a test. We love to test different things. <laughs> uh, you might be watching us, incidentally, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash photoshelter, or maybe you're downla downloading the uh, podcast after you download Serial uh, by looking for <laughs> I Love Photography on iTunes. Whatever the case is, we're happy to see you. All of the links that we're talking about today, you can find on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. Sarah, it's been uh, a crazy 24 hours. Yeah, it has. And so uh, you'd have to be hiding under a rock uh, at this point not to have seen uh, the verdict of a Staten Island grand jury who decided not to convict a Staten Island officer who put a chokehold um, on uh, an unarmed man and ended up killing him. Uh, we can dispute what he actually died of, but the chokehold contributed to the death of Eric Gardner. And that, of course, if you're in New York, as I assume probably all over the country and, and uh, possibly parts of the world, uh, this has been dominating the news coverage because it falls on the heels, of course, of the non-indictment of uh, officer, uh, the officer in Missouri. So, at any rate, uh, on the same night as the Rockefeller Christmas tree was being lit, uh, the verdict came out in New York earlier in the afternoon, and people started protesting. Uh, and here is Todd Heisler, um, a Pulitzer Prize winner who now works for the New York Times, uh, at Grand Central, where they had a, a, a die-in. Um, and it was about 40 people lying on the floor of Grand Central, um, and... Uh, the transit cops and NYPD, I guess, were instructed just to let them do what they're going to do. So the protesters did this. They weren't really impeding traffic, uh, is my understanding from the radio reports I was listening to. Uh, and then they got up and they joined some people in Times Square and they started marching towards Rockefeller Center, at which point uh, they were blocked off for security reasons, which is understandable given the number of people at uh, Rockefeller. So a couple things I want to say about this, Sarah. First of all, the coverage... Uh, that we've seen from Ferguson, the coverage that we're seeing from Staten Island and from New York and from different parts of the country where protests are happening, uh, this, is, this is civil rights photography of our era, of our generation. This is the stuff 20 years from now when, unfortunately, I believe we're still going to be dealing with the same issues. People are going to look back and say this is just this is capturing the same sentiment that, that that they captured that the greats captured in the 50s and the 60s. So in 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 some sense, uh, I feel fortunate to be seeing the the massive amount of fantastic work that we've been seeing from different photographers around the country. Yeah. Now, this is a photo show. We try to talk about photography, and we talk about cultural impact of photography and whatnot. But I think that uh, the events have been weighing heavily on a lot of people's minds. And I also had a conversation with myself yesterday. And I said, we can, we can talk about photography and we can talk about photography in the context of what's going on in Ferguson and Staten Island and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and, and, and have a very sanitized version of it, or we can kind of talk about what's happening um, in as many places as we can so that we can try to push forward some change and make people aware. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go off on a rant for, for a few minutes. I'll keep my remarks short. <laughs> I'm sure it'll turn off some viewers, but you know what? The world is a really fucked up place right now, and we need to talk about it. So let me put my camera back on. Here's the thing. There's there it, if you have never uh, experienced oppression, racism, felt like a minority, felt sexism, whatnot, then you can't empathize with what it feels like to be in one of those positions. 
and you're you're a woman, so you know you've I'm sure you've experienced catcalling and all that, and we've seen all these videos happen. So I can understand if you've never experienced that, and you're living where you're living, and none of your friends or your family have experienced that. That to hear this constantly is a big turnoff. You, you feel like people are pulling the race card and, and, and whatnot, and I totally understand that position. And I can also see the position where you say these guys, uh, these guys are, are 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 criminals. They were in criminal activity. They resisted arrest, and this is what happens and, and whatnot. I can understand where you can come up with that position. I can understand where you say this is not about race. I don't agree with that statement, but I can understand where you're coming from. There's so many great uh, writers who have talked about the race thing, and, and I am not black, obviously, so I'm not going to comment on those. Um, I, I do believe we have a racial problem that stems from a lot of historical things that we did in, in the U.S. The one thing that I don't think you can dispute is we have a police problem. And we've seen so much police brutality, and, and again, it's not all the police, but we've seen white women, I saw one today, a white woman being dragged to the ground uh, because she was talking on her cell phone, and then two cops fist bumping after they basically assaulted her and threw her in the back of, uh, of a cop car. We've seen uh, two guys get shot, and, uh, a guy in Missouri get shot and killed. We've seen a guy get choked and killed. We saw a 12-year-old get shot and killed because he was holding a BB gun. And there's a problem here. Crime is at its lowest rate in like the recorded history of US policing and yet we're acting like we're in a war zone. Police show up on spot with guns drawn, are, are forcibly assaulting people who are, might be breaking the law but with minor infractions, and in a lot of cases killing them. And uh, it's great that we have the discussion of cameras on the cops, but in the case of Eric Garner, we had a camera capture the entire thing and there was no indictment. And I watched that video last night and I started crying because when you listen to that guy saying he can't breathe, it is so disheartening. And I watched uh, the Spike Lee clip from Do the Right Thing. And if you've never seen this movie, you should watch the clip. Just go to YouTube and, uh, and look for Radio Rahim from Do the Right Thing. And it's the exact same scene. Radio Rahim is in the hood, and he gets choked out by a cop. And the only difference between that movie and what happened to Eric Gardner, even though both of them died, is that the cop in Do the Right Thing at least said, dude, stop to the other cop. It's enough. You're doing enough. Stop. Whereas in the Eric Gardner video, nobody did shit. So... Sorry to get emotional about this stuff, but it has to stop. Thank God we have cameras out there. Thank God journalists are doing their job, but journalists are getting arrested. The video evidence is not convicting anyone, and the police brutality and the police state mentality against the communities they're supposed to be protecting is not working. So whatever you have to do to express your frustration, whether you do it via going to a, a protest or a march. Um, I hope you do it all nonviolently, but I hope that, that you're moved to do something to show that the people will not stand for this anymore. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> yeah. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> It's very emotional. It's very it's, emotional. It's incredibly know? emotional. And even with citizen journalism, which is why you first talked about the Eric Gardner case earlier in the summer, you brought it up on the show. I was actually out that day, but um, you brought it up because it's citizen journalism. It's important that we have that, and yet it still didn't make a difference, which is so tragic. And I haven't been able to rewatch the video. I don't. I don't want to. But uh, it's incre It's incredibly disturbing. And cameras on cops will not help. And this is proof that that won't. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
condolences out to uh, everyone who's been affected by uh, any form of police brutality. Condolences to anyone who's been affected by any form of crime. You know, we're not we're not we're not saying that it's right to loot and riot and all of that stuff. We're saying that the police are overstepping their bounds in certain situations and people are paying the ultimate price as a result of that and it's got to stop. And those who don't understand need to check their privilege. Yeah. Check your privilege, guys. Yeah. Okay, now that we've lost everyone or half the audience, <laughs> we can talk about photography. <laughs> no, thanks, Alan. It's was... oh. important. It's important. Uh, you found uh, this interesting piece about uh, a photographer, Richard Hernandez. Yeah, Richard. Who is a prolific Instagrammer and yes. who is going to delete all his photos. Yeah, he's got, so he announces that he's going to delete all of his Instagram photos and immediately, you know, my, my mind went to, oh no, it's because the new ter Facebook terms of service that have, you know, just come out are going to start January 1st, but it's actually not about that at all. He's, uh, he's saying that, you know, I've always felt that a photograph deserves a lifespan and nothing should live forever and Instagram kind of, for him, it felt like an exhib exhibition of his work that was always on display, uh, like as though the doors were open 24-7. And he was like, that dismayed me a bit. So he wants to start a new Start Fresh for 2015, and what he's doing is slowly deleting all of his images, but also providing them for sale for print, which I think is a very smart tactic and move. So I, I, I totally thought the same thing, which is the terms of service are onerous and therefore he's deleting his account. And so right. I was happily surprised to find out that it was for our creative and artistic reasons Yeah, uh, yeah. to do that. I don't necessarily agree with the logic because he said, I really like, you know, this concept of the photo stream where everything is like brand new at the, at the, the you know, at the beginning. The, the thing that you see today when you turn on your Instagram is what I posted most recently. And, and the way that I think people consume Instagram is like they're not going through your entire body of work that extends back a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, so his, his logic in the way that I think consumers are consuming his photography I think is probably flawed. But mm. he, he's the artist and it's his artistic vision. If, if this gives him creative impetus, then I am all for it, man. Yeah, totally. I, I'm a deleter. I'll delete things that I'm like, you know. <laughs> I didn't get enough likes. <laughs> right, right. Delete. There's that. But then it's also like, you know, no one needs to see this anymore. It's done. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, but this, I mean, even this image is like fantastic. The reflection in the oh. window and then somebody's face. Yeah, it's beautiful. It. He very, does very great talented. work. Follow him. Even though he's deleting everything, he's going to be still producing work. So yeah. follow him and on Instagram. It's he hashtag. has, what? 230,000 followers. Yeah. It's yeah. fantastic. Early adopter, man. Go for it. I know. I know. It's awesome. So glad he's not deleting his account, just the images that exist on it. We talked about uh, Google uh, Photosphere when it was first announced. It's an app that allows you to use your camera to create 360-degree uh, captures of where, wherever you are. When I was out in Wyoming, I tested it, and it's pretty awesome. And here's an article, uh, there's a park in New York called Gramercy Park, and it's a private park, and you need a key to enter it. Well, it's like the secret garden. It's the secret garden, and all the buildings around there kind of pay to, for the upkeep of the park, but you need a key to get into it. And uh, this guy got on Airbnb, and he uh, got the key as a part of his Airbnb stay, and he went into the park, and he did a Google Photosphere of the park. Now, photography is not permitted in the park. So, and he didn't know that, so he went in and took it and he posted it, and he's like, hey. And it's cool. I mean, you can see into the park. He's not revealing any secrets <laughs> of the park, but it's cool that it's there. Yeah. And I really like the reaction of the, the woman who's in charge of the park, who said, we're not going to do a takedown notice or anything. So she said, uh, photography is not permitted, but we're not going to pursue this. Which I thought was like the is a good attitude. Like, yeah. what? It's not hurting anyone. Right. Yeah. People still can't get in just because they can see it. So. And I and I think that you know in the same way that you see these these BuzzFeed lists of like 
10 places you must go before you die or 10 places you didn't know were so beautiful in your own backyard. Like photography offers a glimpse to people of places they might not be able to go and creates a bit of a mythology around these places. And so I think in the same way that a lot of New Yorkers will never get an opportunity to walk in that park, in the same way that a guy in Russia will never get a, 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 an opportunity to walk in the park, it's a cool little way to just experience it for a brief second, even if virtually. Yeah. Yeah, glad they're not going to do a takedown notice. And she mentioned, she's like, in this, in this era of drones, you know, like quadcopters with GoPros on, I'm like, we can't really stop this, so it's yeah. okay. I'm like, you're smart, you're smart. Share, share. <laughs> uh, Vice... Huh. You found this and it's really creepy. Creepy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we talked about a couple weeks ago about the photos from Syria uh, and the photos from Cambodia. And those were photos that the oppressive group was taking of the people they were killing. Yeah, just blank, shooting blank portraits of them against a wall. Yeah. And, right and, before they die. And in the case of Cambodia, probably the largest portrait collection of people that were executed. And here on Vice are photos that a serial killer took. Many of the people in the photos, they haven't identified, but they assume that they might be victims because the guy was a prolific serial killer. And photographer. <laughs> and photographer, Rodney Alcala. Yeah. Yeah, he um, was doing most of his murders in the 70s and got convicted, thrown in jail, but he's had many trials since then. But yeah, he has this entire archive of all of these women who he presumably and probably killed. Uh, spooky, because if if it wasn't in the context of knowing that these were people he was stalking um, to kill and, and probably some of them were killed, like they just like, look like cool historical photos. Yeah, yeah, they, they absolutely do. And they're very nice. Some of them are very nice portraits. Yeah. You can tell that, th that they're intimate moments. These first few, it's kind of, you're, you're unsure, you're unclear about their, the relationship with the subject and the photographer. But... When you go, scroll more down, those few where they're in a house or in an apartment, you can tell they're having a moment with him. I mean, they're, yeah. looking, they're gazing straight into the camera, like, just very, very eerie. Well, you know, they say, uh, like, voy voyeurs and serial killers, they always want something to remember the act, or at least that's what they say on CSI and, and those shows that I watch sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Solid research. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I know a lot into the psychology of the, of the, of the serial killer because I watch television. That's good. I know. <laughs> um, we've been talking a lot about nude celebs recently because yeah. they keep coming up in the news. And obviously, <laughs> when we live in America, we're a bit of a prudish society when it comes to the human body. Uh, Madonna was shot uh, for Interview Magazine. She's 56 years old. Um, the photos were taken by Mert Allison and Marcus Piggott, who are, of course, very, very famous uh, celebrity photographers and, and fashion photographers. And, the, and she looks fantastic. Yeah, I mean, she's got a lot of work done, but she also looks... I've seen the headlines where it's like, Madonna looks unrecognizable in these interview photos. And yeah. I'm I'm a little over the celebrity looking unrecognizable. Like Renee Zellweger's plastic surgery, yes. Madonna, the Taylor Swift cover on Wonderland. Like, okay guys, can we just look like ourselves? And like not And and, and that I totally agree. Like it's yeah. it's a shame that Madonna at fifty six looks like Madonna at thirty five. Right. Because it's a little weird. weird. Now she does take incredibly good care of her body. She's she she eats right, she exercises, but clearly there's been either some Photoshop or some facial work and Both. maybe a boob job. And oh definitely a boob job. <laughs> <laughs> but she looks great, so I don't understand. So 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 let let let's forget about that. So the reason why I say there there's ageism in this is because if it was because when Madonna was in her twenties there was a set of photos that came out in Penthouse Magazine or Hustler Magazine, I think it was Penthouse Magazine, of nudes that, that a photographer had taken um, that he owned the rights to and he published those and was paid for by Penthouse Magazine against her will. Yeah. 
And at that time, it was huge. Of course, there was no internet, so it was just Madonna's appearing in penthouse, and you had to, you know, if you were if you're a young kid like me, you had to like sneak into a, <laughs> a deli and try to figure out if you could look at the, the photos. But here she is still looking great, you know, 35 years later, and people are freaking out. Yeah. That's, that's ageist. And also, this was under, she permitted this, she did this rather yeah. than, yeah, back, back in the day for Hustler where she had no say. So people don't want a 56-year-old woman to look sexy. Well, they can go screw themselves. Yeah, go screw yourself. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're sort of painterly photos. She looks great. Uh, I don't have a problem with it. We're going to keep talking about the nudity thing. Here's one about Facebook. So a woman posted a photo of her giving birth. Full frontal. Can't really, can't actually see any, any genitalia. You see some pubic hair and you see a baby coming out. It's not the greatest photo. It's out of focus. <laughs> but it's a human... It's a human... Coming problem. out of a human. It's a human coming out of a human. <laughs> Facebook, so she posted it on her Facebook, and then Facebook banned it, saying, you've broken the terms and conditions, and then reinstated it. Now, remember, Facebook is the same organization who posted, like, uh, beheading videos oh, man. from ISIS. They allowed those to stand, or, or Mexican uh, gang beheading photos and video. Right. But Facebook keeps Facebook won't allow you to post breastfeeding photos. There's no breast photos. This photo was deemed to 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 break uh, their their policy. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. Now, again, th is this pornography? No. No. Do I necessarily want to see it in my feed? Yeah. It, it it has no intrinsic meaning to me. It's not somebody I know. It's not a great photo. <laughs> right. If it was a great photo, then maybe it'd be more interesting. But this is like her for her friends. I I, I just don't really see what the big deal is. I mean, I, I know yeah. I'm very liberal on this front, but yeah, what's the threat. No, there's no threat. It and it, it makes me remember we talked about the companies. Um, that have to go through all the images and take out yeah. the bad ones. They're located in where? Somewhere in like the Philippines or something. Yes, like that. somewhere in the yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, they're they're seeing. I mean, the images that they've described seeing can be so horrific. And I'm not sure why this one got got nixed next to how many other horrific stuff they're having yeah. to ch having to filter through. So I'm glad that it got back up. Also, another this this photo was posted on the same day that the Kim Kardashian cover of Paper Magazine was, where her right where butt, her butt is, just is full. totally exposed. <laughs> right. There's so. just it. I, I don't want to say hypocrisy because I don't think that's actually the right word. I just think there's a real inconsistent application of policy, um, and it really makes you scratch your head. Um, there, there's clearly like there's a celebrity bias as there is in a lot of things because they know celebrity drives traffic and more people will click and, and then they can sell more ads and whatnot. And, and, but there's moral outrage about a woman giving birth. Right. And my only outrage is it's not a great photo. <laughs> yeah, they should have hired a photographer to, to document yeah, that on. moment. <laughs> uh, Melissa Little, who's a fantastic uh, photographer who we've talked about before when she uh, lost her job over in, uh, in Florida, uh, who incidentally was just elected to the NPPA Board of Directors. So congratulations to Melissa. Yeah, congrats. She had She's just a, she yeah, had just ahead. left the Tampa Bay Times in September. Yeah. But we talked about that and we were like, we know she'll get back on her feet and she look, she already has and now, which look, is great. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge, huge coup for the NPPA because I think she's a great photographer a great thinker, a great proponent for photographers' rights, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. She is a Facebook friend, and in her feed, she was outraged over uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Jacksonville. So this is a photo. It's a photo by an artist named Angela Strassheim, who took a photo of, I, don't, I can't remember whether it was her. No, I don't think it's her. It's a, it's a, a nude pregnant woman reclining in the sunlight. This photo was hung, and let me show you the context in which it was hung, because here it is. It's a photo that looks like it's about, I don't know, 11 by 14. I can't even find it within that oh, wall, barely. Yeah, so here it's, it's on the bottom right. Ah, here. yes, there we go. And it's near a stairwell next to the cafe, and a city councilman was outraged 
because the cafe didn't require you to buy a ticket and <laughs> children could pass by. Oh, no. And he said to children, this is pornography. Oh, oh God. And... Come on. So he wanted to defund. He wanted he wanted the mayor to take away funding that the the museum had received. Oh, um, taxpayer funding because it was promoting pornography and whatnot. Well, I I had to Google this guy, this city council member, yeah. Clay Yarborough, because uh, I thought, oh, this guy must be like in his eighties, some old crotchety dude. No, yeah. this guy is like very very young, very young Republican. Um, and what I really would love to happen on the internet is for whenever you Google his name for this image by Angela Strassman to show up. So Oh, let's get blogging, everyone. Everybody, please blog about this and link <laughs> his name to this photograph because <laughs> it needs to happen. He needs to get the he needs to loosen up a little bit. This is a beautiful photo. Angela is an awesome fine art photographer. She's done a lot of great work. And what? Chill out. <laughs> Uh, I, I know it's it's sort of a, a, a fallback and stereotypical to say, but you know people's reactions to things say more about them than yeah. it does about what they're talking about in a lot of cases. And and the fact that he thinks that this is pornography, he knows nothing you know, about art. He knows nothing <laughs> about art, right? Um, and he knows nothing about pornography. It turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Ah, Great. Speaking of porn. Uh, Christoph Bangert has compiled a book called War Porn. And on the Lens blog, he had an interview with James Estrin talking about why we should be looking at graphic photos from war. Um, and so there's a slideshow on Lens, none of which is particularly graphic, but, but I, I think the arguments that you've probably heard before about why we shouldn't sanitize war photos is, is basically the premise of his argument. Some of which I agree with. Actually, a lot of which I agree with. But, you know, on the other hand, I don't want to see a beheading photo right. on the front page <clears throat> of my newspaper. Right. Well, graphic. Right. Well, and he, uh, he talks about that. He says, you know, we should ask ourselves as viewers, what do we need to see? Which... Obviously, you've asked yourself, you've, and you've decided, I don't need mm -hmm. to see a beheading. Um, but a lot of viewers and a lot of people you know, looking at the newspaper don't ask themselves that. So I think that's a really important question he brings up to make you think about. what, As a viewer, what do I need to see to make me realize what war is? Because that's going to be different for every single person. Yeah, and I think a photo like this, which is graphic, um, is something that you wouldn't see typically in a newspaper, and it does give you in a context for how brutal war can be, but without having a whole set of dismembered limbs and, and whatnot. And when we saw the blood being, being uh, mopped up on the floor uh, a few frames earlier, you know, when you see depictions of war, um, oftentimes it's bombs blowing up in the distance. You know, that's the kind of, like when we were seeing a lot of IED uh, photos uh, and video coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, there is a real detachment in a lot of cases mm -hmm. from what's actually the horrors on the ground. And so there's no empathy for what the soldiers are going through, like seeing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and again, if you haven't been in a war zone, and I haven't been in a war zone, but, but I feel like I have empathy for, for the service people who come back and have PTSD. And you're like, dude, get your, you know, get your act together. Like, what's the big deal? And, you know... <laughs> It's a big deal. We're not meant to see this kind of stuff. We're not meant to witness and experience this kind of stuff. No. He also he also talks about in this interview about you know James asks him, asks Christoph you know do you take these photos to try to end wars and he's like no that would be way too naive and he's like yeah. people prevent wars photos don't he was like but you know people look at images so I think images can be one of the many factors that form opinions and thus yeah. might stop war. And, and so we've yeah. seen that from war photography in the past and and then the Eddie Adams photo from Vietnam is often uh, used as an example of how it turned the tide of the public against the war right yeah on Oops. colossal a uh, li little lighter note on a little lighter note <laughs> I, I, I love uh, 
I love all the stuff that people are doing with with these LEDs, and and I've seen Howard Schatz, uh, whose photography is is always really really innovative. He's always trying new stuff. Howard Schatz affixed some LEDs to a baseball bat and had uh, some professional ball players kind of swing it around and created, uh, you know, the drag the shutter light painting type photography. And here's another photographer um, using the same sort of concept on a kayak but also programmable LED lights so the lights are actually changing color as the photo is being exposed. And it creates this beautiful rainbow. Really cool color. and kind of the, the geometry of, of the motion yeah. creates a very distinct pattern. And yeah, I love this one too because of the, you know, the long exposure makes the water look like fog. Yeah, I know, and the light just hovers right over the water. It's a really beautiful effect. People are so creative, you know. I I keep looking. I we, we we've covered Hamza Diaz. He's the teen who takes a lot of these aerial photos hanging off of buildings. He sneaks into buildings in New York City. Love him. Love him. And you know, every time I see a photo of his in my Instagram feed, I feel inspired. Yeah. And like, what a great. What a great gift to feel inspired by what the art and the creativity that someone else is expressing. And when I saw these photos, I was like, man, I need to get some LEDs. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take my tripod out and experiment and do this stuff. Yeah. And that's, yeah, this you know, is a really a, simple, it's a really simple idea, simple concept, but he executed it well and it just looks gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. Here is a Washington Post gallery of Francis Wolf, an iconic photographer who shot for the Blue Note jazz label. Blue Note is probably the most venerable label in jazz. All the greats recorded for, for Blue Note back in the day. Uh, I am a jazz aficionado, so I'm very familiar with uh, Blue Note, and I've been to the Blue Note Club, and I know a lot of these photos. But here's like... You know, a Jewish photographer who was friends with the founder, and he goes in and he starts taking amazing black and white photos, um, iconic, iconic photos from the history of jazz, from seminal recording sessions and whatnot. And the Washington Post put together a really, really nice collection of these images. Um, and they're just lovely to see. They are. I, I've really been impressed with, you know, this the Washington Post's visual blog just got published. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a pretty new thing, and I've I've been really impressed with all the work they've been putting together. And this series is just awesome. I mean, how cool would that be to be back there photographing these guys? I <laughs> like, know, and you don't really <laughs> see this type of work being done anymore, like in the studio. I think, you know, the celebrities nowadays are so protective about their identity and wanting to control the images. Right, they're going to post it on their own Instagram. Rather yeah, the than level having... of trust isn't there. You, you know, we have seen, you know, David Bergman, who, who was a tour photographer with Bon Jovi for many, many years. Um, he does have this kind of access, but it's so rare where the photographer, where the, where the musician trusts you so much that you can just go do what you're doing. Right, yeah. Yeah, I'd say the closest thing we have to that today would be Danny Clinch. But yes. Yeah. I, this even, is my favorite even, shot of Herbie Hancock. Oh gosh! <laughs> piano, it's so beautiful. I love Herbie's it. Herbie's the man. Oh man. <laughs> um, but even with Danny Clinch, it's like he's hired to take a a portrait for an album cover or whatnot. Right. Right. I don't really get the sense that Danny gets called up at two a.m. to say, "Hey, come hang out, come take some photos of us recording." Right. Um, you know the album and, uh, and whatnot. So. It's just, it, you know, the, the, the photography is defined by different eras, and this was an era where photography wasn't prevalent and people had access, and here was black musicians in the, in the, the pinnacle moment of jazz, and Francis Wolfe was there to capture it. Board Panda. I don't even really know what Board Panda <laughs> is. <laughs> And now to Board Panda. And now to Board Panda, but I know that Board Panda often has really interesting photo essays. Yeah, they kind of do. They they have a smorgasbord of, of content, it's just yeah. like all over the place. Yeah. And I guess they have user generated articles because this is a photographer named Marsan Kesik, who lives in the little southern Poland village of Gronkow. And 
And here's another case of, this is in my backyard, so I went out and I shot it. <laughs> and, okay, so maybe the images are a little... I don't want to say gimmicky, but they, they, they kind of have those inspirational poster looks to them. Oh, Some of yeah. Them do. yeah. <laughs> but they're great photos. They are, I know. And he mentions his... I mean, this guy is a total hobbyist. He's just doing this cause for fun. And because he lives near these mountains that inspire yeah. him. And he's really talented. He's really talented. And you know what? You, uh, I mean, I've never been to this village before. But, you know, when I go home to Hawaii and I'm looking at the mountains and I'm looking at the light hitting the mountains, when you get these little spots of light, like you see in the lower right corner here, hitting a little thing and the rest is in shadow and then in the background there's a little spot of light, that doesn't happen all the time. You have to be waiting and looking for the light and then get your camera out and shoot it. And I know all photographers know this, but I'm just re-emphasizing <laughs> the point that it's not like he just walked out and he casually took this photo. He's looking for these photos and these moments and then he works the photos and, and they're really, really gorgeous photos. They are. So, Marsan, keep up the good work. Keep yeah. doing what you're doing. You need to make a calendar. He needs make to make a calendar. a calendar of the mountains. Yeah. Sell a photo to the next iPhone background. This, that's what things, I was right? thinking, too. Yeah, yeah, because they remind me of, of all those. This one could totally work for that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Love that stuff. Uh, Ryan McGinley, who we've talked about a lot just because we love his work, he's a, contempor a very contemporary uh, style and almost kind of defines this this style. He, he, he's one of a lineage of people who kind of shoot his friends and has this very like youthful uh, uh, approach to photography. Was hired by Bottega Veneta, um, a very high-end bag maker, and they shot this in the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Oh, you can totally tell. And this is for the cruise, uh, the, the, the cruise collection. So in between fall, winter, and spring summer lines, the fashion houses release their cruise line because that's when you know you're going to go on a cruise when it's too oh, cold. Yes. So here you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, these these are interesting. I mean, I'd say the the biggest sign that it's a Ryan McGinley photograph is sort of the movement in some of them. Yeah, I agree. That just yeah, the, like this one, just the models sense of movement, but. I'm not super into them. I mean, they feel... Me neither. No. I'm glad you said that. I don't like these. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the great thing about Ryan's work, especially the stuff that he's done while he's been on the road because he goes on these epic you know, summer road trips and takes a slew of models and throws them into these beautiful environments, you know, these just feel so controlled, which, of course, they are. Mm -hmm. They're for a fashion line. They have to be. But, I mean, that's the, the beauty of Ryan's work is that the world always feels so much bigger outside of the photograph and you can get a sense of that from his work but in these it just feels very like the world ends at the edge of the picture and that's it you know <laughs> like it's it, done. it's almost like a mismatch of brands because yeah, you know yeah. Ryan has done work for Levi's for example which is great yeah which and I felt like that was like right in his wheelhouse mm -hmm. um, and 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 to to what you said, it this feels a little bit contrived. Yeah. And it's sort of like Bottega was trying to be cooler than they actually are. Mm-hmm. You know, more 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 youthful and younger than they actually are as a as a brand. And so they they hired Ryan and they they put them in this really crazy setting, but it doesn't quite work for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, props. I hope he got paid a ton. <laughs> oh yeah, and you know, he's, he's got a little video down here. It's got some slow mo in it. It, it it's fun. I, I do appreciate the fact that that brands are spending money to create these lifestyle magazine -y type shoots mm -hmm. um, because it's it's just more opportunities for photographers where it's not just catalog work right. or it's not restricted to the uh, white backdrop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's more, you know, they're they're trying to they're trying to show you an entire lifestyle. It's not just an environmental. It's a lifestyle with a video. And I, yeah, to your point, I hope I hope he made a lot of money off of this. Yeah. Uh, Amy Fitzgibbons, who runs our marketing uh, at Photo Shelter, found this on Design Taxi. It's an online archive of more than ten thousand what they're calling vintage analog cameras, but what I call film cameras. <laughs> Like, That's we're calling right. them vintage analog cameras now. Fancy. <laughs> um, but if you want to see some wacky cameras, this is the place to do it. Uh, it's a French site called Collection Appareil. 
I don't I don't speak French. I, I know I butchered that. I tried. I tried. I took Rosetta Stone. It didn't work. <laughs> um, a for effort, Alan. A for effort. Uh, but some really, really cool, cool cameras. And all these cameras are owned by one guy, right? I'm pretty sure that's the deal. He owns all of them, and he's archiving all of them himself. So he's taking the picture of the camera, and then he pairs it with all the information that you would ever want to know cool. about this particular model. Yeah, and so his archive is just growing and growing and growing, and it's all being documented. So that's great. Stop. You know, sometimes you know, the, you might have seen the Star Wars trailers that are that have come out. I um, have actually not seen them. Okay, well, you know about Star Wars, and you know there's a new Star Wars movie coming yes. out, and all over social media, Star Wars trailers been out, and then people have been making all of these parody trailers, and sometimes I look at this stuff at the parody trailers, and I'm like, who the heck has the time to do this, and why are they waiting? <laughs> like, well, we could be saving, we could be curing cancer with the amount of effort people put into this stuff. But on the other hand, I see this project and I'm like, thank God someone's doing this. Yeah, like it's, yeah. It's actually cool. And people are expressing themselves creatively and again, so that's... Yeah, I'm those are all the... That. I know, Alan, those are all the comedians trying to get, trying to get work. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish we could solve cancer simultaneously and end racism and pr police brutality. Is that just, too much to ask for Christmas? All, just all of it. <laughs> yeah, maybe for 2014, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. We always like to end on an uplifting or a funny note, and here is uh, a photo that you might have seen circulated in uh, social media. The photographer is Johnny Nguyen, or Nguyen, depending on what Vietnamese pronunciation they have. This is actually his first published editorial photo. He's based in Portland. There was a, a rally for Ferguson. And he saw this kid, Devante Hart. Devante Hart is a 12-year-old adopted black kid one of six children uh, for a couple, um, and he was at this rally wearing a sign that said free hugs. Uh, and obviously he was uh, very moved uh, by the conversation that was going on with him, and he, he was talking to this cop, and he said, I don't understand why this is all happening. Like why? And the cop said, I know, I know, I, I, I totally understand you. And, and this was a very genuine, genuine moment of what we need to be doing a little bit more. Yeah. The community embracing the police and vice versa and empathy and a real understanding for what the hell is going on. Yeah. Yeah, this this picture made me cry. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, and also props to the photographer Johnny. He he mentions that he saw he saw Devante with the sign and knew that that's where the story was. So he kind of stuck close to him throughout the throughout the protest, and then was able to capture this really beautiful, moving moment. I just like it just breaks my heart. <laughs> so you know there have been subsequent interviews with Devante and with his mom, and uh, you know getting back to where we started with, with the discussion of race and 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 whatnot. Uh, Devante's mom, again a white woman, said. Devante's proof that these kids can beat the odds, that put in a right environment, they can be successful and an empathetic and contributors to society and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so for all of you who, who hold the belief that the black-on-black -black crime is all of their doing and, and, and whatnot, I, I, I urge you to consider the possibility that that environment and context and uh, historical injustice could be contributing in poverty, yeah. um, contribute to a lot of the social woes. And, and that, if we're looking for a solution to some of that, then, then, then I believe personally that some of that solution is, is in those uh, areas. The uh, beliefs that I've expressed today are not the beliefs of Photo Shelter, but my own, even though you're listening to Photo Shelter's <laughs> I Love Photography. <laughs> Well, thank was you that for a good voicing disclaimer? them. Yeah, okay. it was, and thank you for voicing them. Uh, it was an emotional show. Uh, I appreciate uh, Sarah, you, and the listeners allowing me to use this as a therapeutic session for me. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, Alan. <laughs> um, but a lot, a, a lot to think about. Uh, a lot of great, and again, a, a lot of great photos coming out with all of the stuff that's going on in the world, whether it's in Syria, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Mexico, Russia, the United States of America, our backyard. Photography is there to capture a lot of that, and I'm glad that photography, like we saw from the Devante photo there, initiates discussion, helps to initiate discussion 
about these topics that affect all of us. So a hopeful note, and I hope that uh, we're able to work some of this stuff out. Sarah, I heard you might be marching tonight. Stay yeah. safe. Yeah. Stay nonviolent. Yep. Thanks. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week, Thursday. Please join us. We'll have more great photography to talk about, um, and we'll keep it less uh, less preachy, but, you know, if we need to, we'll talk about it. But uh, thanks for joining us. So for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.